Chapter 4 Patronymics We are sprung from the sea, a county of seaports is our dwelling place, and the sea itself our ample dominion, covered throughout its vast extent with our fellow subjects in their floating cities. These are filled with our wealth, which we commit to the winds and waves to distribute to the extremities of the four quarters of the world. We are therefore no common people nor are they common events which form eras in our history, nor common revolutions which have combined and modified the elements of our speech. Though we have kept no genealogies to record to us from what particular horde of settlers we are sprung, no family chronicles to tell us whether Saxon, Dane, Norse, or Norman owns us as progeny, still our names serve partly to distinguish us, and words themselves thus still remind us of what otherwise would be totally forgotten. It has been claimed that two-thirds of us are sprung from the Anglo-Saxons and Danes, and had our language kept pace with our blood we should have had about two-thirds of our modern English of the same origin, but we have more. Our tongue is, hence, less mixed than our blood. It is therefore easier to trace out the histories of words than of families. It is difficult at first sight to determine whether family names have been derived from family residences or the residences have obtained their names from their first proprietors. The Romans imposed their military names upon the towns of the early Britons. The Danes added their own descript names and previous to becoming converted to Christianity gave the names of their heathen deities to the mountains and landmarks. To these were added the names of Norse and Danish kings and jarls. After the Norman conquest, when the land had been divided by William the Conqueror among his followers, comes the period when surnames were taken from the chief lands and residences. Pagan deities supply us with many surnames, from Balder comes Balderstone. Osbaldistone. Thor gives us Thursdale, Turton, Thursby, Thurley, Thurston, and Thurstiston, in the Wirral, near West Kirby. Freya supplies Frisby, Frankby, Fry, Friar, Freysthorpe, and Eraser. Ulleroyler gives Elswick, Ullestorp, Elston, Ulverston. From a sacred place, like the Borg, the old Jutland sized town. We derive Wydale, Wigthorpe, Wythorpe, Willoughby, Wilbforce, Wigton, and Wyre. Some of our earliest Lancashire names are derived from Gorm, Billing, Rollo, who were Norse and Danish kings. Their names and their compounds show us that the Danes were Christianized, as Ormskirk, which provides very many surnames, such as Orm, Oram, Ormsby, Ormerid, Ormshaw and another form of Gorm, Grim as Grimshaw and Grimsug. Form B and Hornby may also be traced to this origin. From Bill H. -G -R we get by U. Inge, the village near Wigan, standing on a high hill and having a beacon, Billington and other names of this construction. From Rowua we derive Roby, Raby, Rollo, Rollinson, Ribby. From Arving, Anair, we get Irving, Irvine and Erton. From Ota we have Otter, Otley, Utley. The Danes sailed up the river Douglas, and gave the name Tarleton, from Jarlstown. Many Christian names come from the Danish, Eric, Elsie, Carl, Harold, Hugo, Magnus, Olve, Ralph, Ronald, Reginald. Surnames formed by the addition of Sun or Sen are common to both Danes and English but never appear in Saxon names. Thus we have Anderson, Adamson, Howson, Holden, Matheson, Nelson, Jackson, Johnson, Thompson, and Stevenson. The different names we find given to the same trees arise from different settlers giving and using their own form of name, Birch, Bracken, Crabtree and Cawthorn. Wilding is also known in Westmoreland and Yorkshire. Wayset, which gives its name to a small hamlet near Beetham, in Westmoreland, is Danish. Wilding is probably Flemish, and also wild, wild, as this name dates from about the year AD 1338, when you ward three.
encouraged numbers of Flemings to come over from the Netherlands to introduce and improve the manufacture of woolens. He located them in different parts of the country, and we find them settled in Kendal and in the vicinity of Bury and Rochdale. This will account for this surname being so frequently found in Lancashire. From Copenhagen the harbour of merchants, we derive many important place names and surnames. A Copeman was a Chapman, a merchant or dealer, and thus we derive cheap, cheapside, chepsto, and chipping. In surnames we get Copeland, Copley, Copithorn, and Gapenhurst. The common expression to chop or change comes from this source. In the London Lycpney of 1430 we find, Flemings began on me for to cry master, what will you cope and or buy? In 1579, Calvin in a sermon said, They play the Copa Maesters, and make merchandise of the doctrine of this gospel. These early copmen remind us of the Lancashire merchant who had visited the States after the American Civil War. He said to the late John Bright, How I should like to return here, fifty years after my death, to see what wonderful progress these people have made. John Bright replied, I have no doubt, sir, you will be glad of any excuse to come back, to the abundance of surnames derived from Danish origin the following are important, Lund, Lindsay, Lister, Gate or Geld, and Kel. Lund was a grove where pagan rites were conducted. Lindsay is a grove by the sea. Leicester is Danish for a fishing fork composed of barbed iron spikes on a pole for spearing fish. Gate or Geld, an offering of the expiatory barrow pig to the god Freya. From Kel, in Danish a spring, we get Kellet and Okel, surnames of a distinct Danish character and customs derived from Viking days are to be met with in our local fairs and wakes. Writing on this subject, the Reverend W. T. Bulpet of Southport says that, Robert de Cowdery, who died in 1222, was an enterprising lord of manor of Meols, and obtained a charter from the king, with whom he was a persona grata, for a weekly Wednesday market, and a yearly fair to be held on the even day of St. Cuthbert, to whom the church is dedicated. The charter probably did but legalize what already existed. Cowdery was a man of the world, and knew that it would be an advantage to his estate to have a fair. Soon after his death the charter lapsed. Enemies said it interfered with pre-existing fairs. Though legally it had no existence the fair continued for centuries in connection with Street Cuthbert's wake in March. It was also the end of the civil via, when payments had to be made and thus farm stock was sold. This caused the market and wake to be useful adjuncts, and a preparation for welcoming the new year on March 25, St. Cuthbert's Day. The anniversary of his death was held on March 23, and a Viking custom demanded a feast. The old name of the death feast was called Darville, and the name was transferred to the cakes eaten at the wake, and they were called Darville Cakes. Long after the event commemorated was forgotten Darvel Seikes was supplied in Lent to guests at church town wakes. Connected with these fairs there was a ceremony of electing officials, and at these social gatherings of all the local celebrities a mayor was elected who generally distinguished himself by being hospitable. Similar ceremonies still exist, where charters no longer survive, at such places as Poulton near Blackpool and Norden near Rochdale. Traces of the Norman are found in Dunham Massey and Darcy Lever and a few others, but along the whole of the east and north of the county the Saxon and Danish landholder seems to have held in peace the ancestral manor house in which he had dwelt before the conquest, and the haughty insolence of the Norman was comparatively unknown. Speak, the oldest manor house in South Lancashire, near Liverpool, is derived from spica, Norse for mast, which was used for fattening swine. Par is a wooded hill, and this word enters into many compound names. Bold, from Darvel, death and all, feast. Near street, Helens, signifies a stone house, 
and is the surname of one of the oldest Lancashire families. The Norse Breaker, a gentle declivity, is much in evidence in West Lancashire, as in Norbrick, Warbrick, Swarbrick, Torbrick, Kilbrick in the Fylder district, and also Skarsbrick, in the vicinity of Ormskirk. This name used to be spelt Scorsbrick, and is a compound of score, a bird of the seagull type, and Breck from the natural formation of the land. Birkdale, Ainsdale, Skelmersdale, Kirkdale, Anstall, Kirby, Kirby, Crosby, are all place names of Danish origin which provide many surnames in the county. Where Danish names abound the dialect still partakes of a Danish character. English surnames, a great majority are derived from trades and callings. Some may be traced from ancient words which have dropped out. Chaucer and Suter are now meaningless, but long ago both signified a shoemaker. A pitcher formerly made great coats, a reader, thatched buildings with reeds or straw, a Latimer was a writer in Latin for legal and such like purposes. An Arkwright was the maker of the great meal chests or rocks, which were formerly essential pieces of household furniture, Tucker was a fuller, Lorimer was. The ancestors of the poet were, however, more likely Chaucer's, makers of long hose. A saddler, launder or lavender, a washerman, Tupper made tubs, Jenna was a joiner, Barker a tanner, Dexter, a charwoman, Bannister kept a bath, Sanger is a corruption of singer or minstrel, Bocher, a butcher, Milner a miller, Forster, a forester, a chapman was a merchant. The ancestors of the Clemens and Wadiers sold those commodities in former generations, Wagners were wagoners, and nailers made nails. A kemp was once a term for a soldier, a vavas or hell drank between a knight and a baron. Certain old-fashioned Christian names or quaint corruptions of them have given rise to patronymics which at first sight appear hard to interpret. Everyone is not aware that Austin is identical with Augustine and the name Anstis is but the shortening of Anastasius. Ellis was originally derived from Elias. Hood in like manner is but a modern corruption of the ancient Odo, or Odin. Everett is not far removed from the once not uncommon Christian name Everard, while even Stiggins can be safely referred to the northern hero Stigand. The terminationing signified son or offspring. Thus browning and whiting in this way would mean the dark or fair children. A number of ancient words for rural objects have long ago become obsolete. Cowdery in olden days signified a grove of hazel, garnet, a granary. The suffix be in Ashbeck and Homebeck is a survival of the Danish by a habitation. Dean signifies a hollow or dell and the word bottom meant the same thing. Thus Higginbottom meant a dell where the Hicken or mountain ash flourished. Beck it is a little brook, from the Norse Beck. Boys is a corruption of boys, the French for wood. Dun means a down, holt, a grove, and hurst, a copse. Brock was the old term for a badger, hence Brockspawn, while goes in Gosford signified a goose. On dialect in Lancashire and Yorkshire, the district of England which during the Heptarchy was, and since has been known by the name of Northumbria, which consists of the territory lying to the north of the rivers Humber, whence the name Northumbria, and Mercy, which form the southern boundaries, and extending north as far as the rivers Tweed and Forth is generally known to vary considerably in the speech of its inhabitants from the rest of England. Considering the great extent and importance of this district, comprising as it does more than one-fourth of the area and population of England, it seems surprising that the attention of philologists should not have been more drawn to the fact of this difference and its causes. From an essay on some of the leading characteristics of the dialects spoken in the six northern counties of England, ancient Northumbria, by the late Robert Backhouse Peacock, edited by the Reverend T. C. Atkinson, 1869, we learn that when addressing themselves to the subject of dialect, 
Investigators have essayed to examine it through the medium of its written rather than its spoken language. The characteristics to be found in the language now spoken have been preserved in a degree of purity which does not appertain to the English of the present day. It is therefore from the dialect rather than from any literary monuments that we must obtain the evidence necessary for ascertaining the extent to which this Northumbrian differs from English in its grammatical forms not to speak of its general vocabulary. The most remarkable characteristic is the definite article, or the demonstrative pronoun, t, which is an abbreviation of the Old Norse neuter demonstrative pronoun hit, Swedish and Danish et. That this abbreviation is not simply an elision of the letters t from the English article the which is of Old Frisian origin, is apparent from the fact that all the versions of the second chapter, Verse I, for instance, of Solomon's song, I am the rose of Sharon, and the lily of the valleys, the uniform abbreviation for all parts of England is the elision of the final letter E, making the into th, on the other hand, out of fourteen specimens of the same verse in Northumbria, eight give the T occurring three times in the verse, thus, is T rose of Sharon, and T lily o T valleys. The districts where the Scandinavian article so abbreviated prevails are found in the versions to be the county of Durham, Central and South Cumberland, Westmoreland, all Lancashire, except the southeastern district, and all Yorkshire, an area which comprehends on the map about three fourths of all Northumbria. The next leading feature is the proposition, I which is used for in. This is also a pure Scandinavianism, being not only Old Norse, but used in Icelandic, Swedish and Danish of the present day. Two instances occur in the fourteenth verse of the same chapter, wherefore O my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, etc. We have idiomatic version, O my cushat, et sit grags o t crags, it dark in holes o t stairs. Another word which occurs in six of the Northumbrian versions is also Scandinavian, viz, the relative pronoun and for that. From this illustration of a short verse and a half of scripture, we have established the Norse character of the dialect as distinguished from common English, of five of the most ordinary words in the English language, namely, the representatives of the words there, in that, art and am. These instances from the etymology of the dialects help to establish the following canon, that when a provincial word is common to more than one dialect district, that is, districts where in other respects the dialects differ from each other, it may, as a rule, be relied upon, that the word is not a corruption but a legitimate inheritance. Those, referred to, we have seen are the inheritance of a whole province, that province being formerly an entire kingdom, proceeding in the usual order of grammars, having disposed of the article, we come next to the substantives, these differ from the ordinary English in that they recognize only one case where English has two, the Northumbrian dialect dispenses with the possessive or genitive case almost entirely, and for my father's hat, or my uncle's wife's mother's house, say, my fad her hat, and my uncle wife mud her house, upon which, all that need be remarked is that they have gone further in simplifying this part of speech than the rest of their countrymen, who have only abolished the dative and accusative cases from the parent languages of their speech. Extreme brevity and simplicity are eminently Norse and Northumbrian characteristics. We have already seen some remarkable instances in the versions of Solomon's song, where we saw that the first three words, I am there, are expressed in as many letters, namely, I T, and again in verse 14, Thou art in there, by at sit. We have here another instance in the abolition of the genitive case ending, out of many more that might be added. In pronouncing the days of the week we find, Sunday for Sunday, Thursday for Thursday, and Saturday for Saturday, always with the short da. The remaining days as in ordinary English. In pronouns we find were for our, in the possessive case, 
from Old Norse var, relative, at for who, which, that, demonstrative, t there, that the year, that one, thoa, these or those, indefinites, some it equals something, somewhat, from Old Norse, some that, somewhat, the two following are common at Preston and adjacent districts, so as equals whosoever, so hidaso equals whethersoever, correlative adjectival pronoun, Samish equals so much, Swedish, Samikit, adverbs from Scandinavian, backwards, backwards, canily, prettily, nicely, a, yes, for it, forward, forwards, Helga, preferably, I'm morning, tomorrow, I now, presently, lang sen, long since, loosely, loosely, nedha, lower nether, near, no, new, now, Reetly, rightly, sa, so, sen, since, shamfuyui, shamefully, shapely, shapely, so, so, lull, to, wheel, well, wa, where, interjections, ek, exclamation of delight, hoity toity, what's the matter, from old Norse, hootatu, wo worth. Wobitheit, an illustration, a good illustration of Danish terms may be gathered from the following conversation heard by a minister in this county between a poor man on his deathbed and a farmer's wife, who had come to visit him, well, John, she said, when you get in thea you'll may happen see your Thomas, and you'll tell them when hat th shand remended, un a new pigster built, un that we done pretty well bet him. Believe me, Mary, he answered, dost think at oars now for t do bo go clum dot pin up un deal de scoies is each in your Thomas. The word mun also is in frequent use, and comes from the Danish verb mun, the Danish swigger, to drink in, as to tack a good swig, and he he swigged at it. Many Danish words become purely English, as foul, foul, cow, cow. Feud, food, stewed, stood, drown, drown, for a noun and at a noun became forenoon and afternoon, stalker, stalker, cock, cock, want, to want. In popular superstition the races had much in common. The Danish river sprite knock, imagined by some to be Nick, or Ode Nick, the devil, but properly Nick's. A brownie, he wore a red cap and teased the peasants who tried to flit, Danish flitter, in order to escape him. Though we have cretin, to weep, it also means to salute or bid farewell. From the Danish grata, give or greeting, we hear it said to a crying child. While greeting is a popular word of Danish origin, so is yuletide for Christmas, and yule candles, yule cakes. You log. The word tandle means fire or light, and is given to a hill near Oldham. From this we derive our candle. Lake, to play, is still used in our district, but never heard where Danish words are not prevalent. In the Danish, slat means to slop, and it is said, he slat the water up and down. A very common participle in Lancashire is beu. The Danish buin is prepared, or addressed to or bound for, as we're at bumferfku. In Danish and Lancashire apostrophe ling means heath, but it does not occur in Anglo-Saxon. From the Danish snig, to creep, we get snig, eels. Locally we also have the name Rossendale, which covers a large extent of our county. May we not suppose this to be from roast, a torrent or whirlpool, and dale. The Danish for valley, the names of places beginning or ending with garth, or guard, shows that the people were settling in guard or farms belonging to the chief, earl, or udler. With the Danish steen, for stone, we have garsten, garstang, carton, as well as garswood and garden. The Danish having no such sound or diphthong as our th, must account for the relic of the pronunciation at for that which is much used in our local dialect, as its toy I'm at he were here, at being the Danish conjunction for that. The word we use for sprinkling water, dig, does not come from the Anglo-Saxon degen, 
which means to dye or tinge with color, but from Diog Hordegr. Shakespeare uses the word in The Tempest, where Prospero says, when I have decked the sea with drops full salt from clump, a mass or clod, we get clump, as clump of wood, and clump in clogs. Stowe says, he brought his wooden shoes or dumpers with him.